There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode 15 of the Shine On Podcast. I'm Evan Shine. As always, producer David Yaz is with us. We have a really great show today and an absolutely wonderful guest. I cannot wait for today's interview. On today's episode of the Shine On Podcast, I am joined by Susan Guthrie. Susan is nationally recognized as one of the top family law and mediation attorneys in the country. She has been helping individuals and families navigate separation and divorce for more than 30 years. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the divorce mediation process and really demystify what happens inside a mediation. We are going to pull back the curtain on today's episode and get a rare behind the scenes and inside look at what really happens in divorce mediation from the absolute best in the business, Susan Guthrie. What's fact and what's fiction? There's so many questions that I find people have and different ideas that people have about what the mediation process is really about. Can a high conflict divorce be resolved through mediation? How involved should attorneys be in the mediation process? What's the best way to mediate a highly emotionally charged divorce? We are going to get the answers to these questions. Talk about the future of online mediation and so much more with Susan Guthrie. My interview with featured guest Susan Guthrie on episode 15 of the Shine Up podcast is coming up on the other side of the docket. This is an interview you do not want to miss. All right, Evan, the jury has been impaneled. The witnesses have been sworn in, so I think it's time for the docket. Are you ready, sir? Dave, let's do it. Okay. (laughs) And now, let's see what's on the docket. So, Evan, interestingly, this from the Sydney Morning Herald, our friends down under, the headline reads, The rise of collaborative divorce. Families with skin in the game are avoiding court. And the article by Caitlin Fitzsimmons reads, More separating couples are avoiding family court by engaging in so-called collaborative divorce, where the professionals work as a team and all parties commit to not go to court. Collaborative divorce started in the United States in the 1980s, came to Australia in 2005. Industry professionals report there has been a surge of interest in the past year. Your thoughts. Dave, I love this. We're going to stay with the alternative dispute resolution theme today with this episode of the docket. And look, the rise of collaborative law, families with skin in the game, people are looking to avoid court. The article makes mention of the year 2005 when collaborative law started and took off in Australia. And look, as my listeners on the Shine On podcast know, while I lead my firm's litigation practice, We practice mediation and collaborative law, and we offer three process choices to clients and to people going through a divorce. What makes collaborative law so great, and the article touches on it, but what makes collaborative law so great and really a terrific option for settling a contested divorce action, it's the concept of a team. It's the buy-in. It's the mindset. It's the approach. It's the attorneys being trained in the collaborative law process and having everyone invested in making it work, and having the absolute and must-needed mindset when looking to resolve a divorce out of court through collaborative law. Having that mindset, look, Dave, it's everything. Having the clients invested in a process, having the attorneys trained specifically in collaborative law, working with a team of wonderful, trusted, neutral professionals where the focus is the family, that's great. And the article mentions the phrase skin in the game. And what that really means to me in the collaborative process is, look, if the collaborative process does not work, clients need to start over, at least in New York, with new attorneys and all the time and money and emotion that was invested in the collaborative process, it's lost to an extent. That's the buy-in. It's the skin in the game, but really it's, it's an investment in the process. And there's tremendous benefits of the collaborative process, but above all, it's the commitment and the mindset of all involved. And while the article notes that collaborative law 
took off in 2005 in Australia, it's been around in the United States for some time, similar to mediation. But in recent years, collaborative law has gained well-deserved national attention, same with mediation, as a real process choice to help people and families resolve divorce matters. And this was the perfect docket piece for today's episode, because we're going to get into this topic of mediation and resolving divorce disputes out of court with our wonderful guest, Susan Guthrie. Our featured guest this week on the Shine Up podcast is Susan Guthrie. With over 30 years of family law and mediation experience, Susan is nationally recognized as one of the top family law and mediation attorneys in the country. Susan provides exclusively online divorce mediation and legal coaching services to clients around the world through her business, Divorce in a Better Way. Susan is a founder of the Most in Guthrie Academy for Mediation and Collaborative Law Training. The Academy is the absolute gold standard for training legal and dispute resolution professionals around the world. She serves on the Executive Council of the American Bar Association section of Dispute Resolution, and she co-chairs the Mediation Committee. Susan is an internationally well-regarded expert in online mediation and trains colleagues and other professionals. She founded Learn to Mediate Online. She is the creator and host of the must-listen-to Divorce and Beyond podcast with Susan Guthrie, as well as the Learn to Mediate Online podcast. She has been featured in media outlets such as CNBC, Market Watch, Forbes, Thrive Global, and many more. Susan, thank you for joining us. I appreciate the time. How are you? I'm great. And thank you so much for having me, Evan. I've been looking forward to this. We're lucky to have you with us today. And Susan, you are the mediation go-to and the absolute best in the business when it comes to everything divorce mediation. And as a divorce attorney and litigator, I'm often asked to pull back the curtain on the litigation process. I'm often asked, Evan, what really happens inside the courtroom? And today you're going to help us do that from the mediation perspective, and you're going to give us an inside look on the mediation process. We're going to tackle the myths and misconceptions that people have about the divorce mediation process. And so to set the stage for everyone, when you mediate, tell us what the process looks like and how does it work? Yeah, it, it, that's such a great way to start. And I'm so happy to have the opportunity to draw that curtain back on this process because every day I'm reminded that not everyone understands what divorce mediation even looks like. And I would say, you know, from the get-go, typical lawyer response, but it it, it depends on what your personal case calls for, but I actually think that's one of the hallmarks of mediation. That's one of the benefits is mediation is a process that we can really cultivate and grow in a way that best suits the needs of each individual couple that's going through the process. And we often will create a team to support that couple through it. But essentially, you know, mediation is just one more method for hopefully getting to an agreement that's going to resolve your divorce issues, right? You, as a divorce attorney, I'm sure explain to clients, there are certain issues that every case has to have resolved. We have to determine what's happening with your money and your stuff. We have to determine what's happening with your kids. And we have to determine what's happening with support if we have, you know, alimony and and child support issues. So those are things that no matter what your case is, they have to be decided Mediation is an alternate pathway to getting to that resolution of those issues. And it's interesting because when I first flipped from your side of the fence as a litigator to my side of the fence as a mediator, I remember thinking, oh, the kinder, gentler way to get divorced. And, (laughs) you know, I've learned since then, now 10 years in as as mainly uh, a mediation professional, it's not always kinder and gentler. It's not always gentler. It's, you know, you have to sit down and have the difficult conversations, but you're doing it aided by your mediator. It is, I believe, however, you know, all cases call for different things, but I do believe it can be a kinder or more respectful approach. Susan, you mentioned all the the great 
ways that people could, or the benefits in terms of mediation and really, you know, the process choice, and you use the great word as a pathway. And so I want to go through some of the things that I hear from clients or from other professionals about the mediation process, and I would love for you to weigh in. Often I hear from people, Evan, if my divorce is high conflict, then mediation is not the right option for me. What's your response and and, and what do you say to people who have expressed that to you? I love this question. And the first thing I would say is any case can be mediated with the proper mediator and the proper process put in place. And, you know, in fact, I would posit that a high conflict case is actually better suited in many ways to mediation because unfortunately, high conflict individuals will use the litigation process as another tool of abuse. And and you've, I'm sure, been involved in cases where the opposing side will file all kinds of motions that really shouldn't have ever made it to paper, dragged out the process. And so it is another tool. It's another way for a high conflict individual to sort of use the system to their benefit. The thing with a mediated high conflict case is that the mediator needs to be skilled in dealing with high conflict individuals. Understand a mediator cannot alienate the high conflict individual. And that's often what the party who is not the high conflict party is looking for, right? They're looking for a mediator who's going to smack down or, or tell the high conflict person they're wrong. And what they need to understand is that the mediator will lose the high conflict person from the process if they completely just drive them down. They have to support the other individual while also maintaining um, some semblance of control over the high conflict individual. It's a tightrope, I will say that, but it can be done. People use too often the court system and filing motions to really exacerbate that high conflict and cases go on for several years and an already high, you know, emotionally charged divorce becomes even harder and more emotional. And so when I'm listening to you talk about the benefits of meeting a high conflict divorce, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. I think so many people, there's this common thought that you can't mediate the high conflict divorce. And I, I do think that's really unfortunate because that sort of leaves people with this belief that their only option is to litigate. And then they get caught in that cycle you just described. In fact, I was just the other day reading Bill Eddy has a new book coming out mid-June, and I just got an advanced copy of it, and I think it's really going to be a game changer for mediators, which then will lead to being a game changer for the public. It's called How to Mediate High Conflict Disputes, and it is a training program for mediators, not just family law, it could be workplace, it could be, you know, all different areas, but to deal how to mediate specifically when there's a high conflict personality or personalities, sometimes we have them on both sides (laughs) uh, involved and that it's really critical. You need a skilled mediator. You also need, this is one factor that often gets lost and I won't take a high conflict mediation case unless the individual who identifies as the non-high conflict party has a coach. They have to have support in helping them to navigate what the process is. One, they're going to need to be able to come in and self-advocate, which can be difficult with a high conflict individual. And they need to understand that the mediator is not there as their representative, but is there as a neutral to help both of them reach a a resolution. And often for a person who's been involved in a high conflict relationship, they are looking for a protector and they will put the mediator in that place. And unfortunately that just harms their process. So when they have a coach outside the process who can help them keep that at the forefront and understand why the process unfolds the way it does, it can be really helpful. Susan, you mentioned protector, you mentioned coach, you mentioned a team of support, and 
in the litigation context, it's incredibly important to me, and we've talked about how important I think it is for my clients to be surrounded by a team of professionals, to have a great and trusted uh, people that he or she works with to help get them through the process. And so when you mention having a team of support and a coach for someone in mediation, I love that because I feel so many people think that they're alone in the mediation process with their partner, with their spouse and the mediator. Right. And, and that's such a great point because many people choose not to go to mediation because they feel unprepared to participate actively with their spouse in those conversations, right? They're like, I am under enough emotional stress right now. And by the way, I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand the law. I'm going to get taken advantage of. And so many people will just automatically opt out of mediation, uh, out of that fear. And I think much as what you just said, it, 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 the best mediation process is one that is built around what that couple needs. And often what that couple needs is additional support beyond just their mediator. Your mediator may be an attorney. In my case, I, I am an attorney. A lot of mediators are therapists. Some are financial professionals. But your mediator is not your be all and end all in most cases. And it may be that you need additional financial professionals. You may need individual financial professionals. You may need a neutral joint financial professional. And it's the same thing with coaching. It can be, I've been working with Christina McGee, who's an amazing parenting expert, quite a bit lately on complicated or just difficult parenting plan, you know, negotiations or discussions that can be a very sensitive area and very emotional for parents. And Christina has a beautiful way of turning it to being very child-centered discussion, as opposed to what parents tend to focus on is what, how they feel about not seeing their children or their child being at the other parents more or whatever that might be. So there's a, there's a myriad of other professionals. And for me, Having done this now for 30 plus years, the best resolutions are where from the very beginning, we sit down and look at what this couple needs and get them that team before we take them into the process. Susan, I love that. And you mentioned two wonderful professionals, Christina McGee and Bill Eddy, and I can't wait to pick up a copy of you know, the book that you mentioned. And you also mentioned attorneys being part of the process. And we talk about the team and financial coach, divorce coach therapists, and other people who can support the individual and a couple throughout the process. I want to ask you about the role of lawyers in the process. And I hear from clients, Evan, what extent does the law play a role in the mediation process? So I want to ask you, in your experience, how important is it for clients during the process to understand the law and are consulting attorneys part of every divorce mediation? If I had my way, consulting attorneys would be a part of every divorce mediation. And that is not because I don't have, as an attorney myself, the ability to give my clients a neutral understanding of the law as it pertains to their issues, right? But because I think at all times during a divorce negotiation, during those discussions, it is helpful to each party to be able to talk to someone who is there to give them individual legal advice and support, just so that they know what the law provides for and why they may want to vary from it. I mean, we uh, one of the beauties of mediation, and I think you know any divorce attorney knows. The law doesn't always provide for the best outcomes for families. Sure, you know it can because it's blanket and it can't cover every single individual case. So, you know, one of the beauties of mediation is the parties can sit down and and come up with what they believe is going to work best for their family. It doesn't mean that they do that in a vacuum. They should do it with a very you know, clear understanding of what the law does provide for so that they can be very clear about why they want to do something different. And I think that's vastly important. And I think that's something that they should be able to discuss with their consulting attorney. Susan, it's such a great point. And I think any time a family and a couple could, could work together, whether it's in mediation, collaborative law, alternative dispute resolution, 
to come to an agreement that works for them and their family, to me, it's always best. And I want to ask you, because I got off the phone with someone the other day, and she said to me, Evan, I think my husband wants to go to mediation because he doesn't want to exchange financial information and financial documentation. And I hear this. This isn't the first time I've heard it. I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard it. So what would you say to someone who hears or has a conception about mediation that there's not going to be financial disclosure in the process? So, and that, ha- I love that you asked that question because that comes up often as well. You know, first I would say her husband has a misunderstanding of the mediation process and she can rest assured that first of all, most states as a part of just the divorce process, there's a requirement that certain information be disclosed in exchange between the parties. So just because you're in mediation doesn't mean you get to circumvent those disclosure requirements. What you do find is that because mediation is voluntary, it is 100% voluntary. You may be in a jurisdiction where a judge is going to order you for certain reasons to go speak with a mediator, and that may not feel voluntary. But once you're in that mediation, no one can make you come to an agreement, right? That's the voluntary part of it. But for most divorce mediation, where the parties are sitting down with a mediator from start to finish, that is 100% voluntary. And so you do run into those situations where you have a person who's like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not turning over my business records. She should just trust me. Or he says, I'm not giving my credit card statements. It's none of his business, whatever that is. The reality becomes if the other party doesn't feel that they can then make educated decisions because they've not been given appropriate financial information, the process is going to implode and will will not be able to proceed. So if the people are committed to being in mediation for whatever reason, and there are many reasons why people go to mediation, and we could talk about those if you want to, but if they're committed to it, very often that is the impetus that they're going to then have to comply with requests from the other side for disclosure. Susan, there's so much I want to ask you based on your answer. You know, in terms of the process, in terms of the ground rules, is that, and you mentioned before having the right mediator, and is that something, and I know you train and work with other mediators, is that something when a mediator is setting the ground rules, explaining the process the topic of financial disclosure comes out in the beginning of a mediation? For me, it's in the initial consultation, even before the couple hire me. It's when they're deciding whether I'm the right mediator for them, I cover the issue of financial disclosures. And one of the things that's key to point out, you know, as a litigator, you know, you have tools When someone says, "Eh, I'm not given those business records, you've got a lovely little motion to compel you can file. (laughs) You've got things you can do and it can make it compulsory, right? They, They can be forced to do it. As a mediator, I do not have that. I do not have a way to turn to Bob or Mary or whomever my parties are and say, you will turn in that information. But if Bob or Mary wants to continue in mediation and Bob or Mary says, I can't I can't do this if I'm not seeing those records, then you hit a very clear demarcation point where someone's going to have to bring forth that data or the other person is going to be able to to leave the process. So we talk about it too. I mean, that's a, that's a conversation. Well, well, Bob, why don't you want to disclose those records? Is there something, you know, underlying that on your part? And so we'll dive into it and that's more about the mediation, but yes, Financial disclosure is just as much a part of mediation as it is litigation. We just go about it differently. And I think that's so important for people to understand, for everyone listening to the podcast, and for everyone out there who's considering mediation, there is a discussion, there is a conversation, there is a process that is put in place about exchanging documents and really having a conversation about being transparent when it comes to finances. And I mentioned the phone call that I got from someone the other day. She was concerned because she's an artist. She probably couldn't balance a checkbook and she had fears and she had real serious concerns about going to mediation. Her husband works in finance and I explained to her what the process looks like, but that was one of her biggest and deepest fears. 
Yeah. Well, and for her, I would say if I were meeting with them as a mediator, I would be identifying a party that potentially would need a financial support person, either her own CDFA or financial advisor, or we'd need to bring in a neutral financial person because right now we have what she feels is an uneven playing ground when it comes to the financial issues. So in order to level that playing ground, there needs to be some sort of support brought in so that she feels she's when she's called upon to make decisions and agreements on the financial side of their divorce issues, she's going to feel supported in doing that. So right away, flags are going up for me as a mediator that we know a financial professional likely needs to be involved here somewhere. And that's the team of support, the incredible you know, network that clients could surround themselves with as someone goes through the divorce mediation process. And Susan, you mentioned the reasons people will consider mediation in your experience, tell us more about that. Yeah, that mediation, because it's 100% voluntary, I find people have all different kinds of reasons for coming to that table or the virtual table in my case. For the most part, they fall into, I would say, the top three categories of they want to be amicable or they want to work through it cooperatively. That's a, a, a top level goal. Many people are attracted to mediation because Overall, in almost all cases, it is much less expensive than a litigated route. And what I've found over the years is it doesn't matter if you have very little money or if you have all the money in the world, no one wants to spend it on their divorce. It's just, they don't like writing us that check, right? They will do it when they feel (laughs) they have no other choice. And I mean, nothing um, negative about it. It's just, unfortunately, that litigation model tends to be an expensive way to go through it. So that so it may be just a money reason for some people that they're they're motivated to do it because they think they're going to be able to save some money. Other people are attracted to the fact that a mediated divorce usually takes much less time to process than a litigated divorce. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But basically, you, the parties, have ultimate control over the speed of the process. And you can move through your process usually within a a matter of months, as opposed to a litigated case. And then another pretty popular reason is often at the end of a relationship, when it's breaking down, people, it doesn't always bring out the best behavior on the part of some of the individuals involved. And sometimes things happen that they just don't want out in the public domain. And mediation is a confidential and private process. So different circumstances, we can have cases where somebody might have a sexually transmitted disease and does not want to talk about that in a public forum. Some people's children might be going through difficulties and they don't want to bring that into a custody issue in court. Cases where We have self-employed individuals and perhaps their income tax returns are not pristine and they don't want to talk about that in a courtroom. There are many reasons why privacy um, and not airing your personal laundry in a public setting can be appealing to people. So usually it's one of those or a combination of those that brings two people to the table. Very often there are different motivators on each side of the table. It doesn't really matter as long as they're committed to being there. Susan, you mentioned all the wonderful benefits and and the incredibly important reasons that a couple may want to resolve their divorce, their separation in mediation, the confidentiality part of it. And you mentioned that I find in my practice is, is so important because I think mediation, it's such a great way for people to resolve their differences, resolve their divorce out of the public spotlight not in a courtroom for everybody to see. And so that's an incredible benefit. So I want to ask you about, for someone out there who may be reluctant to try mediation because she or he has certain fears or conceptions that may not be accurate about the process. How does someone get over the hurdle of giving it a try? What would you say to someone about the process who may be on the fence about whether mediation is the right process choice for her or him. You know, the, the great, great, great approach to the, this question. I, and I'm thinking, you know, first off, I want everyone to understand because mediation's voluntary, if it's not working for you, you can leave. 
you you don't have to continue. So if you get involved in the process and feel that for whatever reason, it is not the right process for you, you always have a more traditional litigation approach to fall back on. It, as we know, right? I mean, it's always there. You sure. can always go to court. The other part would be is understand you don't know what you don't know. So those fears are based on something that you've, because you don't have an experience of it yet. And I would say, go out and just do a a consult with two or three mediators. Talk to them um, about the process and just to to get an idea because, you know, knowledge is power. I also have, and I can send you the link if you want to put it in the show notes. I have a video on my website that explains you know, how mediation and litigation are different, how it, it all proceeds. It's like a 40 minute video, but it really takes a deep dive into what mediation is. And some people find that helpful to watch themselves or when they are talking to their spouse and their spouse doesn't know whether or not they want to try it, it can be helpful to send them a link to the video so they can watch it and get an understanding uh, in a nuanced way of what mediation actually entails. Well, Susan, I love that. I would love to, you know, have that video because I think when someone can see it and can appreciate the differences between the litigation process and mediation, it really registers. And you mentioned something that is important. The litigation option, it's always there. And so if you can try mediation, try to reach a resolution that works for you, works for your family without going to court, If it works, great. And if it doesn't, then there might be another option after you've already tried the mediation process. Susan, I want to ask you about the future of mediation and mediating in an online world. And it feels like since COVID in March of 2020, mediation and really the interest in alternative dispute resolution in the family law setting, whether it's mediation or whether it's collaborative law, it's skyrocketed. And that's a wonderful and really great thing. But the truth is you were at the forefront of mediation and mediating in a virtual world long before COVID. And you were such an important reason why mediation and online mediation has gained such incredible traction and really national attention. And so I want to ask you, what are you seeing as a leading expert in online mediation, both in terms of the interest that professionals have in developing that skill set? And then is virtual mediation here to stay? Yeah, those, uh, those are two of my favorite things that are going on right now. And, and I, I love the fact, yes, you mentioned I, I moved online six years ago and found that not only did I enjoy working online with my clients, my mediation clients, but my clients, importantly, it, it enjoyed the process, not enjoyed the process, but found it in many ways to be superior to doing it in person. And there's some actual science-based reasons why mediating any conflict, but certainly a divorce online can be easier on the parties when they do it virtually. A few, few really basic ones are instead of mediating in some stranger's conference room, you are in many cases, my clients are sitting on their couch with their dog sure. in a comfortable environment so that they feel at least comfortable. They don't have that additional you know, aspect of being in this strange environment. They also, it's just neurobiologically shown that you can tolerate more conflict and emotional contact when you are face to face, but through a screen, as opposed to across the table from each other. So people are much more able to regulate their emotions because it, it, it does get emotional. I mean, you, you sure. participate in these conversations all the time. So, you know, we know it's go, there are going to be emotional moments. Your adrenaline's going to go up, your cortisol is going to go up, but less of it when it's virtual. And then who really wants to sit in traffic or leave work early to, to go to their mediation? I mean, the convenience of doing it virtually is, was attractive to people. So, you know, I think what happened during COVID is that the public who never knew it was different to do it online, they never had a problem with doing it online. That was the other thing that I found when I shifted. It was the professionals who didn't want to do it a different way than they had always done it. And then they were sort of en masse forced online if they wanted to continue to work. 
And those same benefits that I just talked about became apparent to a lot of mediators and other dispute resolution professionals. And so most of the professional, I've trained over 18,000 legal and, and mediation professionals on how to conduct mediations online during COVID. Wow. And, I mean, that, that's an, incre- an incredible yeah, number to me. I mean, the future of mediation is so bright and it's exciting. Yeah. I mean, we've gotten the, one of the, I mean, silver linings, I guess, to call it of COVID is that the courts were closed. And so that meant if people had a dispute or had an issue, they needed to seek alternate, you know, routes to to resolve those conflicts. And so people who would not normally have tried mediation or collaborative law or negotiated settlement were, were forced to try it or gave it a try and found, hey, this is this is pretty great. And so there's been a shift toward dispute resolution as a primary source or the first course of moving forward with dispute resolution instead of it being sort of at the courtroom door. We're going to do a last ditch effort to mediate this litigated case before we have to go to trial. And I also think that that's meant that many professionals who know that litigation can be very disruptive, especially in the family law field, are like, great, this is a good time to sort of get into that mediation or collaborative or both arena. So we're seeing a large shift from a lot of litigation professionals. Susan, that's fantastic to hear. Look, I saw it with my own clients. I mean, back going you know, last April, May, the courts in New York were shut down. New actions couldn't be filed. So I had clients who couldn't file a new action, couldn't litigate their divorce, they said, Evan, my life's in limbo. I need a resolution. I need a way to move forward. And I'm happy to tell you, you know, which I'm sure is going to come as no surprise, those cases are settled. And we would just be in the infancy stages of litigation at this point. And I also had cases that were in litigation, on for trial. The courts are still not scheduling in-person trials. Those cases, or some of those cases, have also settled in mediation outside of court. And you mentioned mediation becoming the primary process choice and people embracing it online in a virtual world. Are you seeing that shift change as well from the litigation or litigator perspective? I mean, I value mediation. We've talked about it. I think it's so incredible that people could work together outside of court, but are you seeing the shift change from the traditional divorce litigator's perspective into in terms of the response and approach to mediation? Well, I actually have been seeing a shift and it heartens me because I truly believe at our core, all of us who are divorce litigators or who have worked with clients in that model realize that if we can help people resolve the their divorce or whatever family issue they're having in a less adversarial way, it's helpful to them. And so what I've actually seen a great deal of is something that you just mentioned. Cases that are in what I'll call the litigation model, both parties have attorneys, you know, everything's been filed, but they've hit a point where either they don't have the availability of a court or they want to move forward. They want, they're stuck and they really want to move forward. I'm getting a lot more calls from attorneys saying, we, we've agreed we'd like to come and meet with you as a mediator for a day. Put the issues that are still unresolved out on the table and try and resolve these so we can move these people forward. Because I lo- when you said limbo, I always, I have a phrase I say all the time, divorce limbo, that time, that, that, that space you go into when you're trying to work through your divorce, but you're not able to move on with your life. That is Dante's 10th rung of hell that you never, you know, he never wrote about. It is a horrible place to be. And COVID just exacerbated that for people. No, it did. You're, you're absolutely right. And virtual mediations, you talk about it. You're at the forefront. You're an expert. You're training professionals. And when you mentioned traffic, I'm in New York City. And look, people will come into my office and they're either you know, late coming for appointments, trying to come up Fifth Avenue or take the subway and whatever it is. And you see the stress that people feel when they're rushing to get to a meeting with their attorney or a mediation session. And so I think you make a really great point, the comfort that people have by just from wherever he or she is logging on, going on their computer 
and really being comfortable that from a mindset standpoint, I think just would help the process. I mean, immensely. So with that said, do you see a place or a time when there, we go back to in-person mediation or is that dependent on the professional and where everything is? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And, and we're really, st- we're on this verge of trying to figure out what's coming. I have my thoughts based on what I see. And I really think, you know, I did a survey not long ago of the 18,000 or so people who had taken my training at some point in the last year. And 100% of them answered that they intended beyond COVID to continue to offer services online. Now, some will offer also go back to online and in person. Some are staying entirely online. No one said, I'm going to go back to in-person only out of all the people who answered it. And I think what we're going to see is that it's going to be kind of driven by what the clients want, because we are a service industry. We are providing mediation services, legal services. They are services. And our clients enjoy the benefits of working in that virtual setting. Just for all the reasons you said, I was talking to a Connecticut colleague who was sitting in traffic on 995 on her way to the (laughs) Stanford courthouse the other day. And she's like, I bet you don't miss that. And I was like, you are 100% correct. I do not miss that. And our clients won't miss it. I used to have the clients that had to leave their office in Midtown to get on Metro North to get up to my office in Westport because, you know, two hours later, they had a mediation session or an attorney meeting. So our clients are going to want that convenience. The challenge for professionals, and this is for attorneys, for mediators, and for all professionals, I think, is that we're going to go into, I think, a period of hybrid where some people who are participating in the mediation or the meeting will be remote and some are going to be in person. And that presents both practical problems with equipment and how everyone's going to be seen and heard, but also some psychological imbalances with the, the aways and the in-persons, right? You know, it's almost like it, it creates a team feeling. So professionals are going to have to up-level their skills. And that's actually one of the things that we're, we're teaching in our advanced online mediation courses is how to deal with those situations. And I do think everyone's going to be dealing with that because I think that's going to be the norm as we go forward. And Susan, it's such a great point that I wouldn't be surprised if, if we're talking six months from now, a year from now, and the 18,000 people that you've trained that number doubles because I think the virtual mediations will continue. I think the hybrid approach that you mentioned will also be in play. And I think the interest in mediation, even when the court system is back open, I think there's been a shift in people's mindsets with the use of technology that people are really embracing in the mediation process. So I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be at the forefront and teaching professionals really about virtual mediation and everything that goes on in mediating going forward. Yeah, it's it's been a really interesting year and really rewarding because for something that I've long known to be a benefit to our profession and to our clients, it's been a kind of a wonderful to be part of the process of helping other professionals. And I do think going forward, now that pe- more and more people have had a chance to access mediation and alternative dispute resolution. I think ADR is going to move to PDR, primary dispute resolution, like in Australia. In Australia, that's already the norm. People go to mediation or collaborative before they go to litigation. And someday I I believe we'll we'll be there. And it's an exciting time because it also will shift the paradigm of divorce, I believe, which is ultimately the most important thing that divorce doesn't have to destroy families. It can just be restructuring families and and letting them come out hopefully healthy on the other side. Susan, that's such a great point. And this is as as good as it gets. You know, you are the go-to and the absolute best in the business. And I want to thank you. This was incredible. Tell us where people can listen to your two wonderful podcasts and where people can follow all the wonderful things that you're doing online, as well as being part of the great Divorce and Beyond community. No, thank you. I The best places for the podcasts are divorceandbeyondpod.com, which is the divorce podcast. And then learn to mediate online.com is where my trainings are, as well as the learn to mediate online podcast. 
And then Mostyn Guthrie, which is where all our trainings emanate from, is mostynguthrie.com. Susan, fantastic. And we'll put the link that you mentioned to the video between the differences in mediation and litigation. We'll put that in the show notes. This was wonderful. Thank you for coming on the Shine and Podcast. It was an absolute pleasure. It was a delight to be here. Thank you so much. David, another great show on the Shine Up Podcast, episode number 15 in the books, no one. And I mean, no one can give us the type of information and incredible insight on the divorce mediation process like Susan Guthrie. Thank you to all the listeners for listening to the Shine Up Podcast, to everyone who listens on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Thank you. Producer, David Yaz, what a show, what a docket. Susan was amazing. Thank you. My pleasure, my treasure. The listeners can follow me on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Clubhouse. I'm Evan Shine, and we'll talk to you again real soon. 